Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing? Let's see here. Just testing some stuff real quick as I get, it's been a week, I had a week off, so I'm getting rusty in my week off here. say hi in chat here hello chat I see a few people in here with me this morning four or so hope the four of you are doing well hope you had a good spring break um, had some time off didn't have to um, do any tasks for me you were free for the week to kind of chillax so I am uh, going to be talking about disorders today and so there might be some of you who who watch this as a vlog and uh, watch it later but the four or so of you I see in the chat are watching with me if you could uh, participate that would make it a lot more fun so I, a couple of quick announcements for students uh, one I've added all your weekly content so let's go take a look at that real quick in your course shell under course information and content there's a new module on the left well let me do one other thing first and before I jump to that let's go to the course homepage um, I've added an announcement and I wanted to speak on it just for a second at the beginning so this is a our, our week of April 20th through 26th and the thing I would want all of you guys to remember for this week is this uh, we only have three three weeks left and of the three weeks this is one of those three weeks next week's week two of those three weeks and then the last week starting May 3rd is actually finals week and will not include any new content the only thing that you are responsible for during finals week is taking the final exam and so really we just have two weeks of content left this week and next week for that reason i had to make a kind of a tough decision right is like what are the last two chapters we cover because i don't want to try to squeeze too much in right at the at the last moment and so my decision was to cover the two chapters that you probably thought most about whenever you signed up for this class and those two chapters would be psychological disorders and therapies. So this week we are going to discuss psychological disorders, which is a couple chapters out of sequence. Um, as I look to my, uh, the last chapter that you cover was chapter 11, which is stress and health. The next chapter after that, social psychology, which is amazing. And maybe we'll talk a bit about that during office hours next week. It won't be on your final, but it's such a powerful uh, feel of psychology uh, then personality uh, chapter 13 we are skipping those two chapters I do have a reading quiz this week that covers those two chapters you are still responsible for reading those chapters you are just not responsible for them in terms of exams are, are concerned so I know it may seem weird uh, you got a reading quiz it's not over the chapter this week this I'm talking about this week you're still responsible for reading that so you still got the reading quiz out there you can go ahead and take the disorders reading quiz it's open right now uh, it will not be formally due until the end of next week however but anyways I just want to explain that also as all of you have noticed I've completed all the paper grades yes <laughs> your papers I still have other papers and other classes I'm working on um, but I have not quite caught up with discussion board grades the last week of discussion before you guys went on spring break. I plan on getting that done this week. So be patient. I'll get that knocked out. Don't worry about it. Um, hopefully the paper grades I gave you with the rubric and I typed several paragraphs to every one of you guys uh, in terms of feedback to you about the way I think your papers could be better. Hopefully all that makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know. Okay, with that being said, um, 
if there's no questions in chat, I think it's time for us to talk a bit about psychological disorders. Uh, here's the content, course information, content, new weekly module. There are two videos this week. I have them linked and time stamped. One is over a therapy session with a schizophrenic patient here. One is over a therapy session with a bipolar patient here. I want you watching both their timestamps. So the actual video is two hours long. I'm not asking you to watch two hours of video. I am asking you to watch about 10 to 12 minutes for each of these for the therapy session because when you read about in your textbook and we talk about about today, the symptomology and the onset of both of these disorders is going to become really clear to you as you watch the, the patients in a therapy session. You actually see them demonstrate the symptoms. It will be very beneficial for you guys to really understand and grasp the concepts of the chapter. So definitely watch those two videos. Here's the PowerPoint we're about to go over. Here's a link to the YouTube that you're watching. Here's a link to the YouTube for tomorrow during office hours. Uh, there's a reading quiz. There's a discussion board. You need to watch the video specifically of the schizophrenic patient therapy session before you can even begin to answer the discussion board for this week. So that's this week's content. It's I think it's pretty digestible, pretty easy to get through. And now we'll get started with, uh, with our lecture. All right. So maybe you've heard of the term psychopathology. Make sure I don't break the stream here. Psychopathology, you can't see. No one's in the chat letting me know this. <laughs> you just can't see anything I'm showing you. All right, hold on a second. Uh, I like how no one said anything to me. Uh, now you can see it. Yeah, so um, the term psychopathology, the scientific study of mental uh, disorders. Uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on talking about today. Psychopathology, like I said, is the scientific study of abnormal behavior and disorders. And we can define a disorder in, in a particular way, right? We can say it's a pattern of behavior that causes significant distress. I want to emphasize that distress. Harm to others. Harm's function. Uh, there's an acronym I always like to say here for students to think about abnormality. Um, and that acronym is DDIC. I'm going to type it DDIC. Uh, I'm typing it in chat. Dysfunction, distress, impairment, culture, or context. That last C is uh, two Cs. So DDIC, distress. Dysfunction, <laughs> I can't talk. Dysfunction, distress, impairment, culture, or context. When you think about abnormality, I, I think people overuse terms, uh, and, and, and lay people overuse terms uh, that are relevant to psychology that they shouldn't. Let me give you an example. I hear people say this a lot. They'll say, oh, you're so OCD. That, that's, so, um, that's, that's, that's so inaccurate of a statement if you really thought about the level of distress and impairment that someone who suffers from obsessive compulsive disorder experiences you would not use that term so loosely so let me give you an example a lot of people say well uh you know tear oh, right now especially with the uh, with what's going on with coronavirus COVID 19 right people are washing their hands obsessively but like even though you're washing your hands a lot uh, and I've heard people say this, like, oh, so-and-so is a bit OCD about washing their hands due to COVID-19 because they wash their hands five or six times a day or seven times a day. That's not OCD. Uh, OCD is the behaviors are so, uh, the thinking is so distressing. Um, the behavior is so, dis is creating such impairment let's say they wash their hands so many times they cause physical harm to their body like uh, let's say that 
they check, uh, they have contamination fears. They, so they're constantly checking things, constantly washing things. To the point where they forget to feed their children or they are late to work or they don't go to work. And I'm not talking about the people who are off right now, obviously. I'm talking about people that should be at work. That's, that's a level of abnormality that fits the DDIC, right? That the abnormality of behavior is so pervasive that it causes major distress, major dysfunction, potentially major harm to other people, or major impairment about the way you live your normal day-in, day-out life. So a couple of other ways besides DDIC that we can determine whether something is abnormal is to use statistics. And all of you have no doubt seen this curve, right? Some of you are taking a stats class right now. But if I go to the, you know, the bell curve and I look at the bell curve and pull up a, uh, this, the typical statistics bell curve, pull that up. It's not going to pull it up, is it? Here we go. We look at the bell curve and I magnify in on it here. And we can kind of see where most of the people fall. I was looking for the uh, standard deviations. Here we go. Yeah, this is the one. Let me zoom this in here a little bit. Maybe they'll let me. Here, um, sorry, Firefox. View, zoom. Okay, I got it. Here we go. So if we look at the standard deviations, right, about 68% of people fall within one, uh-oh, the stream looks like it's paused. You guys still, let me see here. Make sure that you guys are still following me here. Okay, cool. It looked like from my other computer that we were paused. So let's go back to this. So if we could look at abnormality of behavior, we can say, okay, we can give someone an assessment of some kind and we can quantify the, uh, their behavior, uh, their impairment, their distress. And we can put them in this bell curve. And what we can do statistically then is, right, we can say, the, let's, let's say anyone that were at the acute ends of the standard deviation would be abnormal. So look look to the bell curve. And over here we have more than three standard deviations. You're talking less than a third of a percent of people, right? That's extreme abnormality here. So if I look, let's just go to two standard deviations. Let's say 95% of people. If I give someone a stress scale, if I give someone a depression scale, if I give someone a scale that measures a psychological attribute that could be resulting in a disorder, what I could say is anyone who scores over here greater than two standard deviations or less than two standard deviations, we could identify as abnormal. So we sort of already do this in education, right? We give IQ tests to students and students that score abnormally high over here on IQ tests, we label them in education as what? Gifted. Gifted. They're, they're abnormally high in IQ and they should be placed in some type of intervention like gifted and talented programs. Or conversely, let's say they score over here on the lower side less than two standard deviations. What we could say is what? They are abnormally low in intelligence and we could put them in special education programs alternatively. And so we could use this statistical approach to assess abnormalities. That's another way in addition to the DDIC. Uh, lastly, we could go back to just social norms. And what I mean by that is, I mean people that deviate from the kind of unspoken rules of our society, our social institutions. You know, uh, we, or even not just unspoken, but spoken rules, or, or legislated rules. You know, we have laws that uh, 
say you can't harm another person, you can't physically assault someone, you can't kill someone, you can't steal, you can't do a lot of these things. So the people that would deviate from those social norms, we would say are abnormally, we say they're criminal. We say that those behaviors are socially deviant and not normal for our culture. And we would uh, potentially prosecute these people or, or put them in jail. Uh, so we could look at it from that perspective. So there are three ways. Think about it. These three ways. DDIC, abnormally high levels of distress, dysfunction, impairment culture. And then we could measure someone. We put them in a statistical bell curve. And we could say, okay, they're low, they're high, they're abnormal. Or we could look at it socially and say, okay, hold on. They're deviating from our laws, from our kind of uh, socially accepted norms or rules, and therefore they're being abnormal. And you'll see that that last one a lot with antisocial personality behavior. And I'm, I'm going to play you a small clip of that in just a minute where you'll see it. All right, so let's, let's go back to DDIC for a second and let's talk about the last C, culture context. Now I'm gonna horrify every student in the in the and watching this, and I want you to type in chat to show me your horror. Let's assess um, my behavior, and I want you to determine whether or not it is abnormal. Let's do that. Let's put Terry under the microscope, Doctor Rollins under the microscope. Here's the behavior, and you tell me whether it's not it's abnormal. A few years ago. I was in the same room with a student and we were both naked. Is that abnormal or not? I'm waiting for your chat responses. Some of you are calling the college to report me. Is that normal? Let's hear it. This will let me know if you're really listening in chat, by the way. Is that normal or abnormal? I and a student in a room together naked. Yes or no? What do you think? Normal, abnormal? And which of the three do you think we could use the model, right? Clearly it's uh, DDIC. Abnormal. Amber Lentz is abnormal. Okay. Others. Amber Lentz worried at this moment. <laughs> about me but me and a student naked in a room together others there there are, and there are more of you watching i see seven of you watching so come on sounds abnormal gavin's like abnormal terry you should not be doing that any others so far everyone thinks i should not be there it's abnormal Some of you are so horrified, you're just not even going to answer. I get it. So I'm going to have a rebuttal and say that it's normal. Here's what you got to think about uh, when you uh, determine abnormality. abnormality. Let's go back to the DDIC. Distress, dysfunction, impairment, culture, or context. Let's consider the context. No one asked me the context. All of you went straight gutter ball with your thinking. Uh, and you thought, oh, Terry's clearly uh, talking about something sexual, which I'm not at all. Actually, two years ago, I was at the Pigeon Forge Community Center. I was working out. I came out of a workout. If you've ever been to that facility, the showers are separated from your lockers I got out of the shower I was walking from the shower back to uh, my locker to get dressed and there walked one of my male students uh, and <laughs> kind of awkwardly like gave me the wave and I was like how are you it was very awkward uh, but it was also very normal because in a workout facility right in that context that's normal so Gavin Emberlin do you feel better now are you no longer going to call the dean or authorities on me? Yeah, it was just a, it was a locker room setting. So I think in that particular setting, that's pretty normal, right? All right. People are feeling better, hopefully. 
which kind of leads us to this situational context. Yeah, I was just talking about. But l- let's talk about some other aspects of disorders that that are really uh, that you really have to understand when it when it comes to someone's abnormality of their psychology. Uh, it is a very subjective area, right? <clears throat> Think about something like depression. How does one know objectively how depressed another person is? It's very difficult <clears throat> to measure that, even with a lot of the great tools that we have today. Scales that have been validated for years and decades in some cases. Um, it's not as though you can walk up to a person, look at them, and objectively assess the depths of their emotional distress or discomfort. It's just very difficult to do. And so you have to approach this chapter and thinking about these disorders that way, that it's very subjective. Now let's contrast that with something that you could easily relate to. Let's say that you broke your arm. Okay, you broke your arm. Uh, you come to, theoretically, you go to school. Right now we can't. But theoretically, you go to school with your broken arm and it's in a cast. You walk through the door. Everyone can objectively look at you and know that you are broken. They, they can see that you are hurt. And with that, I think, comes a certain understanding and acceptance and acknowledgement. But see, many people walk into your classrooms, places of work, churches. It doesn't matter the context. And you look at them, and they don't look broken. But they are broken. They are suffering depths of emotional distress like something like depression and so it just takes an acknowledgement of people to to think that way Um, in terms of maladaptive thinking or behavior think about the way that thinking can cause inability for you to live everyday life right cook clean take care of yourself take care of other people go to work manage money earn income these things that you just have to do day in, day out to maintain a normal life. That's what we're talking about when we say maladaptive thinking, not just disagreeing with someone. For example, I see that a lot today in social media where two people disagree and one person will call the other person insane, which is crazy because insanity is not a term that psychologists use. That will be a test question. I will throw it at you guys, by the way. I'm going to say that one more time. Sandy is not a term psychologists use. That's a term used in a court of law. Psychologists use terms like onset, diagnosis, nomenclature, disorder, symptomology, treatment protocol, intervention. They don't use terms like insanity or crazy. That's a very kind of big term that usually has a negative connotation that really doesn't describe anyone uh, specifically. So, all right. Um, some of the terms we do use is terms like disorder, which is nomenclature. And if you've ever kind of uh, studied science deeply, you'd know that, you know, when it comes to taxonomies, well, let me back up. When it comes to organizing things, we usually have terms that we use to kind of narrow the specificity of what we're talking about. So you have certain categories of organization and in a scientific term we use that we, we call those classifications and in a particular medical term or more specific term we call that taxonomy and taxonomies lead to really specific nomenclature or labels of disorders in the, in the case of psychology. And so some of the nomenclature we use are things like major depressive disorder. Uh, we use terms like post-traumatic stress disorder. Those are nomenclature that help us define a particular disorder, right? And as I mentioned earlier, we don't use the terms like insanity or crazy or anything like that. So, <clears throat> there are, like anything, there are certain models that we use to look at contributions to abnormality. One of those models is biological. So things that you guys are already familiar with, we talked about in prior tra- chapters, right? That is, how do changes in dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, how do these 
chemicals or hormones. We'll say how do changes in uh, oxytocin change behavior? Uh, how do changes in um, how do changes in sex hormones, testosterone, change behavior? So the biological kind of model or perspective. When it comes to disorders, guys, one thing you have to kind of accept immediately is there's no silver bullet, right? There's there's no one model that's going to explain how they start or how we treat them. What you'll find is, and as you read throughout this chapter, that certain models have more contribution than others, given the particular disorder. Uh, you know, for let's I'll draw off the top of my head, something like anorexia nervosa has little biological model evidence at this time has a lot of cognitive or social cultural model evidence let's, let's look at those models so biological is one view uh one model another model is the psychological model so things you're already familiar with freud psychodynamic view is it something some kind of repression going on in the unresolved unconscious mind behaviorism is it something you learned that's causing this disorder cognitive perspective is it some type of distorted thinking or illogical thinking that's kind of fueling it oh is it really laggy hold on a second let me see if i can change something i'm going to pause the stream for a second tiffany hold on a second and see if I can get remove the lagginess. Hold on. Don't leave me. Okay, let's see if I'm back now. It looks like I'm back. I cannot type today. Back. How about that? Oh, only two people watching. I lost people. I lost people. Let me refresh this here. All right, four back. Um, I hope that helped, guys. I hope that helped. With the lag. Had to, had to <laughs> go to my router and kick my son off of um, his streaming. <laughs> if you see a upset adolescent come to the door behind me, give me a minute to deal with him because I just cut off his PlayStation and his iPad from streaming. He was pulling down a lot of data. <laughs> we'll see how that turns out, right? Might need uh I might need help. I might need intervention from some of you guys if he comes to the door upset. Anyways, we were talking about uh, models of abnormality. Oh, it's down to one. Uh, losing people. Hold on. I'm, I'm going to wait for a second. I'm gonna, hopefully people come back. All right, still waiting. Come back, come back. Give it just a second more. Okay, I see another person popped in. Another person popped in. That's good.
Okay, we got four back. Looks like it looks like all of you who were gone are back. So again, sorry, I just mentioned I was saying before I had to kick my son off of I had to go into my router settings and kick my son off of his his um PlayStation and his streaming. So all right, so I'm gonna continue on. Uh so Again, we talked about the biological models. Let's talk about the psychological models. Again, psychodynamic, behaviorist, cognitive. You guys are very familiar with these theories. These theories help us understand abnormality along with the biological model perspective. As I mentioned a, min a minute ago about um, eating disorders, the sociocultural perspective, right? Things uh, uh, like we know with anorexia, there's a huge huge influence of social cultural perspective and and this is particularly evident with women right uh, actually young girls uh, we see in early adolescence through late adolescence and even into early adulthood this onset of this kind of bizarre behavior where they abstain from food and they get below 80 percent of their target body weight uh, their organs start to have trouble functioning because there's so little fat reserves in their body and that largely is driven we know from a social cultural perspective when it comes to body image uh, we see very we see this huge disparity between males and females when it comes to anorexia and bulimia for that matter uh, due to what we believe social cultural perspectives um the biosocial perspective is kind of a meshing of two things. It's looking at, or three things, three things actually, biology, psychology, and culture all into one explanation. And what you'll see a lot of the uh, content of this chapter, you'll see a lot of evidence, new evidence, kind of saying, hey, the reason that the disorder shows up and the way we treat it should be considered through this biopsychosocial perspective where you're looking at all three aspects of how a disorder starts. So we use in psychology a book called uh, the DSM-5. I would show you my book, but it's in my office at Walter State, which I cannot go to at this moment. <laughs> they won't allow us to enter the building. But in that book, and you can, you can find electronic versions of it online. Uh, in that book, it gives psychologist a diagnostic criteria set for every particular disorder and disorders are grouped by type so you have mood disorders things like depression uh, bipolar disorder things like that you have anxiety based disorders things like phobias uh, things like um, uh, I just drew a blank. Things like phobias and things like generalized anxiety, what's often called GAD. Uh, things like um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. All those are categorized under anxiety disorders. So we have categories, and in each one of those categories, we have this diagnostic criteria. Let me show you what it looks like. Let me pull up uh, the DSM-5 criteria. For PTSD. Take a look. Let me try to find a good solid source here. Oh, that's wow, going to actually have me. I want to download the PDF. Let's see here. Medspace sounds like a decent. We'll find out. I'm generally familiar with the criteria, so let's look. See if they have that. They don't have it. All right, let's go back one second. Oh, then I, okay. This should be, this should be good here. Yes, this is it. So, look at at the very beginning. I'm gonna magnify this a little bit so you guys can see it a little better. The following criteria apply to adults, adolescents, and children older than six. For every description of criteria, you're going to see qualifiers. you got to meet the qualifiers before you can use the criteria to make a diagnosis. This is from the DSM-5. 
So we look and it says, okay, exposure to actual or threatened death or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. Direct experience, witnessing it, learning that it occurred, or experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to aversive details of it. Like think of first responders, police officers. We'll go through this a lot. Uh, presence of one or more. Notice these, these criteria often have one or more. You'll see some say at least two, at least three, uh, four of seven, things like that. One or more of the below criteria. Persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with traumatic event occurring as evidenced by one or both of the following. Negative alterations in thinking, cognition, and mood associated with the event worsening after the event and two or more of the below criteria. Market alterations in arousal levels. So you see, guys, this is an important moment of clarity. A lot of times my professor friends and at Walter State and others will say, so you're a psychologist. Yes, I'm a psychologist. Is that a science? Yes, it's a science. And they'll say to me, so how does that make you feel? In other words, poking fun that we're not a science. We are a science. We follow really strict criteria in this manual to make accurate diagnoses so that people can be treated effectively. And the DSM-5 is that manual that we use. They update it. I wish I could tell you often, <laughs> but they don't. They do something called text revisions on it from time to time. But many, many years went by between the fourth and fifth edition. The fifth edition, I guess, is about three, four-ish years old now. I can't remember exactly, but it's it's been around for a few years, shall we say. But we use that manual to diagnose disorders. About 250 different diagnosable psychological disorders are in the DSM-5. Don't worry. Don't worry. You're not going to be required to remember 250 different disorders for me for the test. You will have to remember that that the DSM-5 is the main manual that psychologists use and that we use criteria and that it's stringent. So remember the categories I was mentioning before? Here they are. And, and again, this table is just good reference material. Not going to be on the test. Certainly not all these percentages. Bipolar. Anxiety. Schizophrenia. Social anxiety disorders. Phobias. Panic disorders. These are all anxiety disorders. Um, notice the category, and these are just a few. Obviously, they're 250, so we can't go over all of them. But a few I wanted to talk about we're gonna, I wanted to show you some film footage of in a second so let's let's get to that for a second um this goes back to the perspectives we were talking about earlier and I think I'm not going to lecture too much on this guys but think to the theory and the, what the theory says and then how it might explain why a disorder occurs you're very familiar with these theories we've talked about them all semester long psychodynamic behaviorist cognitive so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there Let's talk about some specific disorders. And the one I want to focus on first is mood disorders. And let's go to let's go to let's let's talk a bit about depression. So uh, in the DSM-5, we have, we have major depressive disorder. We have depressive episodes. There are different criteria. Uh, for both of those disorders. Uh, and I, I want to show you a snippet of major depressive disorder. And what I want to show you, and this is not going to be on the test, but I want to show you this as well. I want to show you the criteria. One second here. I want to show you what the criteria for major depressive disorder is. And then we're going to watch a bit of the film and try to see if we can notice some of that, uh, of this criteria. And then on your own, I have a couple more films linked for this week I want you to to look at. So let's see. Let's go down here. <clears throat> Sorry. The folder I wouldn't even be at the very bottom. Uh, 
Okay. Where did I put my... Stay, thanks for staying with me, guys. Sorry. Struggling here for a second. Let's go to... I believe it's going to be nine. Oh, sorry. That's eating disorders. <laughs> my slow laptop. This little Apple is doing all it can do to stay up with the streaming... And uh, not nine. <laughs> Bear with me, it's coming up, I promise. Come on, Terry. Come on, Terry. You can do better. I thought it was further along in the semester. Though. This is from my abnormal. Here we go. Now we're in the right section. Let's go take a look at the criteria for major depressive disorder. Uh, it's bipolar. Let's go back here. Here's some common features that you're about to see in film. You're going to see extreme distress, dysfunction, impairment in things like functioning and motor movement, motivation, emotional state. And what I mean by that is hopelessness, uh, withdrawal, um, apathy, lethargy as you watch this woman talk think look to these features we're just talking about here emotional state motivation and function let me show you what i'm talking about here i'll play a little bit of it and then we'll see if we can hear some of it i'm gonna put my mic kind of close to my computer so you can hear her talk No, those videos. There we go. Let's see, I'm get my volume right here. You talk a little bit about the night you had last night. You oh, really had a rough night. Yes. Yeah. How did it start? I mean, you mentioned a little bit to me uh, when I came. And then it's so bad that I won't even get up and change the channel, nor will I get up and get the remote to change the channel. Yes. I mean, it's really dumb, and I sit and make play games with myself about now as soon as this commercial is over you're going to get up and change the channel and I don't how do you feel about yourself oh I hate me I really hate me I hate the way I look I hate the way I feel I hate the way I talk to other people do you find yourself feeling guilty about that? all the time I do everything wrong do you find yourself feeling guilty about things far in the past that are yeah way past doing anything like, like that. 20 30 years ago something I said to somebody that hurt their feelings yes. and I didn't mean to do do you have much when you're feeling that way do you have much hope for the future is, is there any hope in your view or is, is that gone um, the only hope I had the only thing I was hanging on to all these years of was I was waiting for my children to get through college mm -hmm. so that I could be done done. Um, I felt that that was kind of a goal that I wanted to get to. What do, you, what do you guys think she means by done? You know, when you hear someone speak like that, uh, that kind of thinking, uh, to me, that's a, it's a huge red flag when someone says, yeah, I was waiting for this event to be over so I could be kind of done. Done with what? Life? So suicide also is common occurrence we see in major depression major depressive disorder 
And uh, I think you're hearing a bit of that in the way she speaks. And, and it's done. And I don't know where else to go. I'm, I like have to find something else to do with me. Because there just isn't anything to do. So you feel like really you don't hopeless. have much of a purpose? No, yeah, nothing. There's no purpose now right. for you. You mentioned feeling suicidal. Has that been every day? Has that, that feeling stayed with you throughout the five months? It's almost every day. Um, I try not to concentrate on it like... This is Thursday, am I going to think about it today? But I do find it almost every day that I think this just isn't worth it. This this hurt. So um, I just want to play a little bit of that and we can move on. But I mean, could you guys not hear that in her voice? I mean, you could you could just hear the emotional little lack of, of motivation. Um, and obviously she's been diagnosed with major depressive disorder and um she's demonstrating a lot of the symptomology we talked about right lack of motivation she even heard her say she can't get off the couch to get the television remote like her motor function is so lethargic right that she can't will herself to get off the couch that is the the level of dysfunction that we often see in people suffering from major depressive disorder. So um, that's one example. I'm going to show you one more. Let's kind of skip down here. Uh, let's go to, let's talk a bit about personality disorders. So uh, often students will say to me, hey, Dr. Rollinson, what's a sociopath? What's a psychopath? And I'll say, well, we don't have those terms in the DSM per se, but we use terms like antisocial personality disorder. And they'll say, well, what's that? And I'll say, well, it's, let's go back to DDIC for a second, um, distress, dysfunction, impairment, culture. And let's also talk about social deviation from norms. And I'll say to them, well, it's a person who lacks empathy for other people. And so what they often do is they violate social norms. They break the law. And they often hurt or harm people along the way. Uh, you know, go back to to Columbine High School shooting, for example. When that happened, I remember vividly because, as you guys know, I'm a gamer. That's my hobby. I love to play video games. I also happen to enjoy lots of different styles of music. And I remember after that shooting, the news stories were just raging with trench coat mafia. It was because they were on the web it's because they were playing video games it was because music they listened to and it just it just infuriated me it was because both of those boys dylan klebold and eric harrell were harris i believe um they were clearly antisocial. i mean they they to to perform the kind of acts that those boys did to kill people they even know uh to me was a, a clear sign of just a lack of empathy for other people and gross you know deviation of social norms and it, it kind of give you some insight into that i want to show you a therapy session with someone who's going to showcase some antisocial personality disorder symptomology so some things i want you to listen for lying stealing uh under the age of let's say 14 that's the criteria that's in the DSM-5. It's under a certain age. You can hear George, the, the guy in the therapy session, say a lot of these things. If I can find him here. Yeah, this is George. So as you listen to him talk, he's off, he's very charming, actually, when you hear him talk. Very charming guy. A lot, a lot, but the, the, the lying that they will demonstrate, they're the kind of people oft, often you wanna, you'll enjoy listening to. They're very engaging often. Until you upset them, and they can get violent. So let's listen to George uh, a little bit, and you'll get a sense of this antisocial personality disorder. Take a listen. They had a sickness, but I didn't know I had a sickness because I was always, you know, distributing it to them, and uh, I just got to a point where I had just, my mind just got so bad and everything. I, I couldn't nobody tell me nothing. 
And I ain't care. I ain't care about nobody. I ain't care about myself. I ain't care about my mother, my father, my kids, nothing. So it was like it got so bad where I had to put a gun up to my father's head, and then put my hands out of my mother's face, calling her all out her name. Mm -hmm. And it was like a. It was like I ain't. You know, anybody could have took me out, and if they would have shot me or killed me, I wouldn't have cared. When you were telling me when you were younger, under 15, you had all those fights. You ever had a fight with a weapon that you were carrying a gun or a knife? A knife. A knife. So again, another key criteria in the DSM-5 is under the age of 15. Sorry, I had that misspoke. Did you use a weapon to cause harm to another person? If he says yes, which he's about to say yes, check on that criteria, move down the list. You make enough of those checks, you can make the diagnosis. Uh, that was when you were under 15. Yeah, that's when I was little. I had, uh, was my mother, since she'd been working, she been working the course, that gave me a break on the case like that. But I ain't got caught with 13 inch switchblades, uh, throwing knives and everything. I ain't caught a lot of different things like that. How old were you when that happened? Like 11 to 12 years old. I used to, uh, throw bricks at people and bust their heads, hit them with bottles and everything. I ain't caring. You know, whatever it took to beat him, that's what I did. Now, when you were doing that, were you really trying to hurt him? Yeah, I was trying to hurt him. Because, like I said, you know, I, didn't, I didn't have no feelings for nobody. Mm -hmm. What I felt like killing somebody, before I came in this hospital, what I felt like killing somebody, I didn't care about it. When you were younger, less than 15, did you ever destroy property? I used to see the bus drivers coming down Grand Avenue, and opening up, uh, once they opened the bus door, mm -hmm. throw bricks at them and everything, then run. How old were you when this happened? 10 and 11 years old. You know, I was right down the street from the house. So I ain't had it for a run. I want you guys to hear something. I'm going to read you from the DSM-5, the criteria for antisocial personality disorder. I want you to think about George, what he just said, about throwing bricks at people, uh, you know, getting angry with his parents, you know, violating their rules. I want you to hear this. From the DSM-5, there is a pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others occurring since age of 15 as indicated by three or more of the following. One, failure to conform to social norms with respectful to lawful behaviors. Two, deceitfulness as indicated by repeated lying. Three, impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Four, aggressiveness and irritability. Five, recklessness or disregard for the safety of yourself or others, which he clearly, I think, just demonstrated. Six, consistent irresponsibility. And the biggest one, seven, a lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent. And you're going to hear him in a few seconds just say something like, just for the hell of it. Talks about something. And, and that's a, a very indifferent response. Like, well, you hurt somebody. We think about that. Oh, I was doing it just for the hell of it. Um, let me let a little bit more of this roll. Hold on. You know, one time I took a paper machine. Once you know they had the papers in, mm -hmm. I took it and dragged it in the boys' club, busted open, took the money out. Out of the machine? Yeah. You know, you break the machine, mm -hmm. that it has a top. I broke the top off and took the money out of the machine. Was that something you do a lot when you're younger too, lying? Lying to people? Yeah. Lying, get out of a whooping. Okay, how about at school? Lying at school? And yeah, like I mean, I was lying daily at school because, you know, I go back to school. Why wouldn't you at home? I mean, why wouldn't you at school? I was, I was sick. Go home. My mom was like, was you at school today? Yes, man, I was at school. No, and I wasn't even at school. I was at home on the telephone, watching TV, legs kicked up and everything. Mm -hmm. Now, how about uh, fires? I know I asked you that Yeah, question. I had a... Uh, I ain't did no major fires like burning buildings up and then, but I ain't tell you the other day. You know, I used to set trash cans on fire, right? Now, were you doing that to keep to keep warm or? No, nah, doing that just just to see some fire, just to, just for the hell of it. There it is, the indifference, right, guys? So you hear the indifference in the therapy session. You hear George just like, "Hey, uh, were you trying to stay warm? Was there like a reason why you were destroying?" Just lighting trash cans on fire. And I know that's not a huge destruction of property, and it certainly could do a lot more damage, but just think about that for a second. 
the reasoning, the logic, the thinking. Well, were you doing this for a purpose of survival? And like you and I can understand, right? Um, maybe we violate some law because we're trying to survive in a in an unforeseen circumstance. You can understand that, right? But what you can't understand is someone saying, no, I wasn't trying to survive. I was doing it just for amusement. I was doing it just for the hell of it, as George would say. Um, that's like a perfect picture of what I'm talking about with antisocial personality disorder. Uh, let's see here. We got about five minutes left. What I would leave you guys with is this. Um, let me swing my mic back here. What I will leave you with is this. This week, when you when you are working through the task I have for you, I have two videos. I have two videos linked for you. And one is over schizophrenia, and one is over bipolar disorder. Do more categories. So if you watch this video with me this morning, and you watch the other two, you'd have been exposed to four or three different categories of disorders, both depression and uh, depression and bipolar are considered mood disorders. Antisocial personality disorders are considered one of ten possible personality disorders. And then schizophrenia is this whole separate category of disorders. When you watch those videos, I want you to look at the slides, read the textbook and the criteria, watch the therapy sessions, and try to identify the features of those disorders. It's very important as you read this chapter that you know that you conceptually understand the main features of every category. Mood, anxiety, schizophrenia, eating and health, stress-related disorders. Like, Look for the major features for every category as you read through. Um, tomorrow, during office hours, provided, well, depending on how many people ask questions about papers, and which I doubt uh, there will be many of those, uh, I'm, I may pick up here and talk a bit more. We'll just kind of see who shows up tomorrow and who's in chat. Uh, I do want to dedicate some office hours time. I don't want people to feel like intimidated because I'm lecturing. They can't ask questions. And it's not just you guys, right? I got other classes too. They come into those office hours. Not just my dual enrollment. Sorry. Maybe clear. So um, we're, we're right at the 12 o'clock time period. I'm in the stream in a few minutes. But before I do... Uh, or are there any questions I could answer for you guys and uh, or just chat about anything for the last few minutes uh, about how you're doing or if I could answer any questions for you. I'll sip coffee and wait for you to respond. As you're typing, I'm thinking about it, keep typing. Next week will be different, right? Next week... Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. Next week will be different uh, in that we still have, we have content. I'm going to show you, we're going to break down the three major approaches to therapy on Monday of next week. On Tuesday of next week, during my office hours, I will again do a final, I'll do a final exam review. And so using Kahoot. And I know this last test, I think was a bit easy-ish. Because my time limit didn't work right, like I hoped it would. But I can assure you the last exam will not be that way. It will not be that easy. So I don't want you to, to stumble into exam four thinking it's going to be as easy as exam three. Because it will absolutely not be. It will be over the last few chapters, but it won't be as easy as the previous exam. I promise you that. Um, so no one's typing. <laughs> no questions. So no questions. Uh, if there are no questions, I'm going to... It's 12 o'clock. Is it fun? No, no, Tiffany, it's not. Yeah, Emily, it's there. Uh, it's it's under this module. This The PowerPoint that I was showing today is under this week's module. The 20th of the 26th is the very first thing in the module, Emily. Uh, and Tiffany, no, the exam only covers... It's only going to cover three chapters, I'm fairly certain. Four chapters, possibly. We'll talk about that more next week, but it'll cover disorders, therapy, <clears throat> for sure, 
uh, and I'm still thinking about the other couple chapters, but definitely disorders and therapy so far. Any other questions? Hopefully I answered Emily and Tiffany's questions. Well, you guys keep on keeping on. Keep being safe. Keep washing those hands. Wear your mask. I've been wearing masks out to the store. It's been weird. It's weird to wear a mask in the store, but I'm doing it. Some people have looked at me <laughs> like with a side look, kind of a side eye. Like, why are you doing this? That happened like two weeks ago. Now, this last week when I went to the grocery store, I noticed pretty much everyone was wearing a mask. But uh, I hope you guys are staying safe, staying healthy, wearing your mask. Hope your families are doing well. We just got a few weeks left, guys. We'll be done, and you can enjoy your summer. All right. Well, it looks like that's it. I'll bid you guys a farewell until tomorrow. See you tomorrow around 11 a.m. if you want to come and hang out, ask more questions. It, again, if there are no questions tomorrow after the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes I'm sitting here, I'll probably start talking again <laughs> about disorders. So um, maybe I'll see you then. You guys have a great day. We'll catch you later.